Hello everybody. Today I'm joined by Dr. Darvina Doshe. She got a doctorate degree in pharmacology from Creighton University. She is a retired major in the United States Army and she has a lot of good information about cannabis and the topic of sex because that's what we're talking about today. Sex and cannabis. Did you know that there's quite a bit of veterans that are coming out of the military at such a young age that are experiencing some sexual difficulties? We don't hear a lot about that, and that's not surprising. But today there's a four-part series we're about to execute right now to talk about this. So stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our show today. Today we have a very special guest. Dr. Darina Doshe is with us today. She's going to talk to us about sex. Uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure we we uh, acknowledge with veterans is that why do veterans have more of a problem with sexual related issues, and why is it starting at such a young age? Uh, one thing people need to understand is when veterans get out of the military, the time frame and the age of that is usually between 26 and 38, and that is a prime area for most of uh, men and women to be in the prime of the libido. So what's going on with veterans that are coming out of the military with this high testosterone level, but with a low libido level? Why is this happening? Doctor, would you please tell us about where you come from, your expertise, and we're going to dive into this subject. Okay. Well, Robert, I am so excited to be here, and I've been looking forward to this uh, unique topic because it's um, not a lot of people just, just simply shy away from it and don't want to talk about it. Uh, but just to give you a little um, background about myself, I am uh, I have a doctorate in pharmacy. I had specialized in psychiatric and pain management, and I'm also a veteran. I honorably served for served for almost eight years um, in the army and retired in 2017 due to a chronic back problem, um, which led me to uh, the cannabis world. And I've really been um, immersed in that because I found um, a lot of help with Canada, with natural medicine, um, away from all the medications that I was prescribed. And I wanted to share my side of the story. So I'm not just a clinician who talks about research. I'm also a clinician who's also a patient. Now, reflecting on the topic that you're bringing up and you asked, why are we seeing sexual uh, dysfunction in young soldiers? The reason behind that is not just um, that they naturally physiologically have that problem. A lot of the soldiers, and, and it's actually younger than 26 years of age too, we see it in, in 23, and 22 years of age. And that comes with several problems. So most of them tend to have a behavioral health issue. With that, also they're soldiers, so they might have had some phys physical injury that affected their body image or their function, so that triggers them to think lower of themselves, so they're low self-esteem. Then they might be also on medications because a lot of veterans tend to have problems with insomnia, for example. Well, insomnia, just another chronic a problem that causes patients to have lower sexual drive and less lower libido. Other issues, well, uh, obesity is a common thing, even though they're soldiers, but they tend to have problems and they gain weight and they get out of the military. And now obesity is causing sexual dysfunction. Um, and, and really, what is sexual dysfunction? And like, what what is, how do we define sexual dysfunction? Because people go, like, well, I don't have that sexual dysfunction. Well, Sex health is really a, a great predictor of, um, of other emotional and physical health issues that we go through, right? So sex health is, is a state of physical, emotional, and mental, um, and also sometimes social. So social thing, things like, for example, you know, you, you just got divorced, right? So that affects your desire for sex, your, um, how you view yourself, you're depressed. Oh, well, let's talk about depression and soldiers, right? Depression is extremely high. Probably half the soldiers have depression. And with depression comes other comorbidities. And guess what? Now they have insomnia, like I mentioned earlier. So you put them on medications for their depression. They start taking their, their medications. The most common one that's used is a class of drug called SSRI. That's the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, those are things like your Zoloft, um, you know, that um, the Prozac, those are commonly prescribed and they're on the safer end. Now, one of their side effects, it, it affects the libido. 
So in the effects of libido, now that's a sexual dysfunction because they can't, they don't have the drive for it. Uh, they just don't feel confident enough, which reduces the desire. So now that you have depression, you have erectile dysfunction with that. And it's not just in men, it's also in women. So when we say that sexual dysfunction, it really does not discriminate. It actually it happens to both, but you hear more men talking about it because it does have, we have a magic pill that we can give men, not so much women. So we reserve to other options to treat these patients. So that's, we talked about depression and insomnia. Now, one of the insomnia, some of the insomnia medications that they prescribe happen to be also antipsychotic medications. And those are um, medications that tend to increase the level of, of different hormones in your body, like prolactin, for example. You know, you, uh, we were talking earlier about this topic, you and I said, what is the secret with these medications? Well, the secret is they also change and alter the hormone levels in your body. So that's where we, we give them SSRIs, for example. Now they have reduced libido. We give them another antidepressant like Wellbutrin to balance them out. So great, we give one thing to treat one thing. Now we have another thing to treat another thing. So great, we did fix the sex issue with that. Then now they can't sleep. Then we give them another medication. Well, that medication actually increases their prolactin. Prolactin is the hormone that um, produces milk in, in, in lactating mothers. Um, um, and so sometimes also some medications increase their estrogen level. So, you know, if you're a man, you're supposed to have a certain level of testosterone. Now you have estrogen. Naturally, you have estrogen, but when we give you too much or your body is producing more than it needs to, now you have a uh, deficiency somewhere else. It's, it, it's a balance. Right. So this is a good question. On average, the general public at this young of an age between in, in the early 20s to mid 20s really don't have a lot of comorbidities. But on average, the the person who comes out of the military will have two to three times the amount of core morbidities that an average person will have. So the question that that kind of comes up is, you know, what age does this normally happen in, in a person's life versus what we're seeing in this in the veteran population? There seems to be a drastic measure. Like if it's normally happening at 50, but in veterans, we're seeing it happening in the 20s. That is a huge change, mm -hmm. right? So why why is this not seem to be coming up on people's radars? So it is on people's radar. It's just not something they talk about often. You know, you're not going to see a typical 22 year old saying, "Oh, I, I have you know ED and I'm taking Viagra." It's not something that they they talk about. You know, they hide it. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I actually meant, failed to mention. You know, soldiers have gone through physiological and physical damages, injuries, right? So that causes also neurological problems and nerve damage problems. So it's not just um, antipsychotics. You have also uh, uh, nerve medications um, that also affect the way your body handles things. Now, to go back to the age topic that you mentioned, so traditionally, we used to see it in older populations. So we're talking about maybe... I'm going to say 40 and above, just to be on the conservative side. Yes, our age is now expanding because we used to, you know, the life expectancy was a lot lower. It used to be in the mid 40s and it increased in the mid 70s. Now we're in the 80s. So with increase in age, we were seeing medical issues that we weren't seeing before, right? So that was one of the the age and the medical issues that happened during that age. So things like diabetes, diabetes causes erectile dysfunction, um, blood pressure medications, thyroid problems, stroke, uh, chronic pain, and so on. So those were seen more in the mid-age and above population. Now we're seeing it in younger population because we have something called PTSD and we have emotional problem, we have isolation, we have uh, increase in divorce rates. So why does that happen? Well, let's not forget, they are a complicated group of patients that have gone through so much trauma. Even if they don't have PTSD, and PTSD is not just for soldiers, by the way. Also, people that haven't gone to war have PTSD. But people just think that PTSD only affects soldiers, and they think that whenever somebody has PTSD, oh, my gosh, they're crazy. You have to put them on chains. It's really not that. It's, a, it's an emotional response, and you just don't know how to regulate your emotions when you're faced with a similar traumatic experience. So um, 
And when they're in that PTSD situation, they, uh, or they, they're triggered, the word is they're triggered. When they're triggered, their body goes through what's called the fight or flight response, right? So they're just on high alert immediately. Well, sex is a similar concept. It's also a fight or flight. And your body goes through similar hormonal exchanges. And when these young patients are struggling with PTSD, are faced with sex and the, the similar hormones are circulating in the brain, sometimes they freeze. Not that they want to. And if anything, it just causes more trauma for them. Now sex becomes a difficult thing. Like how, how, how do I perform, right? How do right. I perform? I, I'm so young. So, so that's the dilemma we see is the increase in behavioral health issues. The other thing, alcohol. You know, alcohol is not a drug that a lot of people talk about because it's legal, right? right. So they self-medicate. So they start taking more alcohol Acute alcohol use is not going to cause um, problems with, with sex. You see that more in chronic patients. And an average, if you look at the American average when it comes to substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder, we're talking about 8 9% of the American population have some kind of, some form of addiction to those substances. Now, addiction is a big word, which we will get to in a second. Um, but with the veterans population, it's actually double that. It's in the 20%. Well, alcohol, now you add alcohol to other medical problems. That's a disaster that's waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. So we're not just talking about sexual dysfunction. Other problems are also taking place in your body because you're now messing up with your liver, or you're messing up with your brain. It, it, it just, the cycle goes on and on. on. So that's the other issue that we see with, with young soldiers and uh, veterans is the the increased number, uh, like the overuse utilizations of alcohol and substances that affect their performance. The brain gets rewired during PTSD and traumatic events. And you're right, it doesn't really matter if you were in war or there's sexual trauma. There's a lot of different types of trauma out there that create PTSD. Uh, and studies have shown this, the brain really gets rewired for the simplest form to it. The medications that they're giving for these antipsychotics, what is the purpose of those medications? Is the purpose of those medications to fix that rewiring um, what, why, I guess what, what I'm getting to is when the brain gets rewired, it's obviously going to have a, have an effect on your sexual drive. So does that antipsychotic, is it looking, is that drug there to, to fix that rewiring or what is the actual, uh, end result for that drug when they, when they talk about antipsychotics is the rewiring of the brain with PTSD. No, that's a great question. And it's a topic that's, um, discussed a lot and people think that we give the medications to fix PTSD. No, we don't give the medications to fix PTSD. We give the medication to offset the signs of the disorders that are happening with PTSD. For example, they tend to have anxiety, right? So with anxiety, you give them medications to combat that anxiety. Or with with PTSD, you also have um, insomnia or you have depression. So we're treating those. We're not treating the PTSD. PTSD is a complex. It, it's, it's a lot of different things together. But you're treating the underlying issues, which is now depression, anxiety. And really, the best, med- the best medicine is not a, a, a pill. It's actually, with PTSD, it's actually re, um, reintegrating into society. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them tend to have this, um, they're depressed, so they don't want to go outside. Right. They, 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 they socially, they're very, you know, pro, they just, they prohibit themselves from going out. Why? Self images. They don't know people. Soldiers tend to move a lot. They don't have a good, uh, a strong circle of friends. So they're a lonely group of people. And just recently, our Surgeon General just identified loneliness as a major public health warning. And it is. I mean, if you look at other cultures. You don't see depression as high, but you see it more in the in the uh, Western societies, and that's because we separated ourselves from the society. We make more money. We when we're 18, we just move out of the house, out of mommy and daddy. Now we go into our own house by ourselves, sitting between four bo- you know four walls. That's that loneliness. With you know, and as we grow and want to expand in our professional world, we start moving. We move to new cities, new places where we don't have a lot of problems. Add to that somebody who has emotional issues, insecurities, anxieties, they're not going to go out and integrate into society. So they start to rely on the next best thing. So they do therapy too. Therapy helps a lot. The next best thing is medications to help them cope with it. And really the medications are not meant to be forever. 
Medications like antidepressants are really supposed to be for six months. Sleeping medications are only supposed to be for six months. Yes, sir. Even if you read the VA and the DOD uh, mental health guidelines on these different topics, they're supposed to be for six months. But patients don't know how to cope. It's funny how your brain forgets how it puts itself back to sleep. So now we have to give it a pill. But the pill doesn't teach you how to sleep again. So you're supposed to do what's called cognitive behavioral therapy or for insomnia, CBTI. So that's, that's how you help we teach the brain how to do things. So now you overcome that insomnia issue. Now with anxiety, you have to work with anxiety through therapy to rewire and change the way your brain thinks about a certain trigger, right? So through cognitive behavioral therapy, through working with, um, with a therapist. So that's usually the best way before medication. Sounds like the best PTSD medication is physical or, or, or therapy that you have to physically do, right? Um, kind of like going to the gym. You know, if you're wanting mm -hmm. the, the yeah. longer you stay away from the gym, the harder it is to go back to it just to work out. I know I struggled with this all of my life as a big man. I've always been, I'm six foot two and 290. I've always been a big guy and I've always had a struggle with that. Oh, gotta go to the gym, gotta work out. And I'd rather stay here because this is my comfort zone. This is what I know going there is outside of my comfort zone, but staying here is not good for me because I won't live long. I have to get out of that comfort zone and PTSD, part of that therapy and part of uh, learning how to reintegrate back into society. It's something we don't we don't teach. I haven't seen a single thing about, I've heard people wanting to go through therapy, but usually when they're there, they're trying to figure out why it is I am the way that I am. Instead of trying to figure out, well, it's good to know that, but now you got to, how do I get myself back into society where I'm working and talking with people? And the pandemic didn't do us a lot of good because we separated from everybody. And I knew that was a bad idea.